So understanding a more modern form of radiotherapy. So in the 30s, probably, this is how we delivered radiotherapy. And as Amy was talking about, a pediatric case, the child was literally sat on the bed and the x-rays waved in their general direction. Um, it was completely imprecise and there was no sparing of any tissue. Uh, everything, everything got the same dose. So what has changed? Well, technology has really um, moved on tr dramatically. And these are just some examples of more modern radiotherapy machines. With the top left is something called a cyber knife, which is on a robotically mounted. Top right is a true beam, which is a conventional linear accelerator. And then the ring is something called a tomotherapy or Radexac machine. And then the bottom is a linear accelerator with a different form of image tracking. So all of these different forms of technology give us different ways of, develop, of delivering radiotherapy. And they allow us to be far more accurate and conformal in the target. So these are just some of the dose distributions we can choose to give with more modern radiotherapy than we could have done with the more old fashioned or conventional type, types of treatment. And this is an example of one machine which we, we use at the Marsden called a cyber knife. It's different from a standard radiotherapy machine in that the radiation machine, the linear accelerator, is, is mounted on a robot and it can move in, in all different planes and delivering very fine beams of radiotherapy extremely accurately. And it has ability to track a target as it moves. So it has sensors, X-ray machines on the roof and a sensor on the floor which allows us to take real-time images. And essentially, as you can see, that radiation beam is tracking, in this case, a lung cancer in real time and is only delivering the radiation when the tumor is in its path. That, which we're looking at now, is a, what's called a multi-leaf collimator, which is mounted in the head of the linear accelerator and allows the beam to be shaped in all different forms and, and sizes. And this is the, the newest kit on the block. It doesn't look particularly exciting, but in that is a a, a radiotherapy gantry, and on the same gantry is mounted an MRI scanner. Um, extremely complicated physics to do this, but it means that in real time we can see with MR scans what we're treating and potentially how it's responding to treatment. And this is a totally kind of different way of being able to deliver high class radiotherapy. So that's just the machine on the inside with the two different gantry rings. The, the LINAC and the MR mounted on the same machine. So these technologies have allowed us to think very differently about how we deliver radiation and why. So the precision allows us to use a much larger doses to the target. And this is a concept called hypofractionation, or at the extreme, we call the stereotactic body radiotherapy. So standardly, we've always given small doses of radiotherapy over a long period of time. For instance, for a prostate five, 10 years ago, we would have treated with um, two gray per day over seven and a half weeks. So patients would have had to attend 37 times for treatment. That's now standardly done over a four week period with a slightly larger dose. And we'll look at a little bit data later about doing this far more quickly over five treatments. But one of the other areas is treating um, metastatic cancer. So oligometastatic cancer means cancer that is spread, but to a small number of sites. Generally, it's termed one to three. Some people decide, define it as one to five. And it was first described in 1995 um, by these two, um, Hellman and Vishalmalm, who said it, it represents an intermediate stage between localized disease and more widespread metastatic disease. And the concept is that if you intervene at this stage and you try and completely ablate that metastasis, you may prevent further metastatic disease and actually potentially cure some patients who we would have thought conventionally would have been incurable. So standardly for radiotherapy in metastatic disease, this picture on the left is a spine and you can see that there's knife health, healthy vertebrae above and below. And then where the arrow is, is a disease vertebra with cancer, which is pushing backwards onto the spinal cord. And traditionally we'd have treated this with the, just a straight field of radiotherapy. And that's the picture on the right. But now with more modern imaging, with PET imaging, with whole body diffusion weighted MRI, we can find the metastasis much earlier. So scans that we may not have been able to pick up with conventional imaging, we can now see, which gives us the ability to try and target these. 
So this is a case of someone who had previously been treated for prostate cancer and their blood marker, their PSA started to rise again a number of years after treatment and scans showed this early um, recurrence of a disease in a lymph node. Um, and this patient had previously had radiotherapy below this area, but that could be targeted with very focused radiotherapy. And that's what we did. And this is an example of those, all those blue cones represent beams of radiation. And then you can see there's a sort of contour map with very lines which are very close together. And then the dose away from the target falls off very quickly. So as opposed to what Amy was mentioning, when, for instance, when we used to treat testicular cancer, all that bowel getting a high dose of radiotherapy. In fact, the bowel aroused getting very, very minimal radiotherapy, but the, um, the target, the actual cancer is getting a very high dose. And this is what's called stereotactic radiotherapy. And that's just an example of the two. So I showed you before a wide field plan for a spinal treatment, and then the far more preci precise plan that we used to treat this solitary area of recurrence. So, so how do we evaluate SBRT? Well, Amy has shown you um, real, world, real world evidence, which is actually, to be honest, probably still the majority because randomized studies in this area are not always easy to do. But randomized data provides us level one evidence and is still the best evidence we have if it can be generated. So what questions should we ask? Well, first of all, will this treatment actually improve cancer outcomes and improve survival? What will the impact be on quality of life, both positive and negative? And what are the alternative treatment options? Is this very focused, accurate radiotherapy better or worse or, or no different? And also importantly, is it cost effective? So my main area is prostate, and I'm going to show you some studies of prostate SPRT. So this is a study called the PACE trial. Um, and it looks quite a complex organogram, but if you just follow down the left, patients with low or intermediate risk prostate cancer, they had, tend to have a choice between a radical prostatectomy, which is surgery, or a radiation-based treatment. And in this study, people who were going to opt for surgery had the choice to randomize between either surgery or, or SBRT, so that was five fractions of stereotactic radiotherapy. And patients who are going down the conventional radiotherapy route opted but randomized between four weeks of radiation and again the five weeks. This is a similar study, but just in higher risk patients, and I'm, I'm not going to discuss that one further today. So the current study trial status, the surgical randomization has completed. Um, it is a relatively small study, 123 patients recruited. And we presented the results as the plenary session in GU ASCO this year, and the paper is being uh, drafted as we speak. Um, PACE B has that's the one between standard fractionated radiotherapy and five fractions, has also completed accrual. And we have presented the two year and uh, late toxicity results, um, and, the, and also we presented the acute ones, which are the ones in the first three months. Um, the very late results that Amy uh, referred to would be many, many, many years away, but the two-year toxicity results have been um, both reported in the, in the last oncology. Um, and PACE-C has also closed, but no analysis is done yet. So these are just the, the papers on the, um, on the late toxicity, which is in the, uh, the Lancet. So that was acute, and this is the late toxicity. And I'm just going to show you the not the detailed results, but this is the primary outcomes for toxicity, which were the um, RTOG, which is a toxicity scale we use to measure. And we looked particularly at the grade two, which grade two significant side effects do tend to have a significant impact on people. Um, and you can see for genital urinary that there was 2% in the conventionally fractionated um, radiotherapy and 3% in the SPRT. And this was not statistically different in um, so. So really encouraging that you can give these much larger doses per day over a shorter period of time and not compromise their genitourinary toxicity. And similarly for their gastrointestinal side effects, again for grade two, very low in both 2%, um, which is much lower than historical radiotherapy studies um, for the conventional and 2% for the SBRT. And again, no statistical difference. So, it looks like this treatment is very, very safe and well tolerated. Um, we don't yet have the cancer outcomes for the PACE B study, but we will literally have them in the next few weeks, and they will hope, hopefully be presented um, at a meeting later this year in San Diego. 
This is just showing it graphically. Um, the, the darker green is zero toxicity, the lighter green is grade one, and then you can see the small bars at the top would represent the grade two and grade three. So generally these treatments are extremely well tolerated. So how have we answered the questions? How, does, how do have we improved survival on oncological outcomes? Well, we don't actually know yet, but it's highly likely they'll be very similar, but we'll have to confirm that later this year. How does quality of life compare? Well, they look very, very similar. And it is an extremely efficient treatment. These people, patients are done and dusted within one, one week, uh, five days of treatment, as opposed to the much longer courses they've previously had. So I think you probably still say that they're in balance, but I think that it's starting to tilt strongly towards SBRT. So how does SBRT compare with surgery, which is actually not a radiation-based treatment, but is another way of treating localized prostate cancer? So this is the primary endpoints of the PACE A study. And we expected that most, well, we know that most men who receive radical treatment for this stage of prostate cancer fortunately are not going to die of prostate cancer. Very, very few men will die. So it's in fact very important that their quality of life is one of the prime objectives of the treatment. And therefore, when we designed the study, we had two co-primary endpoints. One was for urinary toxicity or continence, because we thought it was likely surgery would probably be worse. And second one for bowel bother, because we expected that bowel bother would be slightly worse for radiation. So we didn't want to bias one against the other. So they were co-primary endpoints. At the time, this was sort of a battle of the robots. Uh, most of the patients in the radiation arm were treated with a cyber knife. And on the right is what's called a da Vinci robot, which is how patients are now operated for prostate cancer. That's ro robotic assisted surgery. It was quite a novel study at the time. And if I use a car analogy, it was you know two of the, ta the two top high end sort of um, elements of treatment for, for prostate cancer. So the Formula Ones of treatment. But actually, in reality, as I've just said, most of these men are not actually going to die of prostate cancer. So the race is who's not going to win the who, which car is the fastest. It's actually which car is the most comfortable. Um, so is SBRT going to give us a better quality of life or at least not a worse quality of life than surgery? So this was a study. These are men with um, low risk or um, intermediate risk prostate cancer. Most of them had intermediate risk disease. Their prostate cancer details for those that are interested are listed on the third line. And they were randomized on a one-to-one -one, um, between surgery, which was robotically assisted, or um, SBRT, five fractions treatment. And this was the results. So the first co-primary endpoint was continence. So the use of urinary pads at two years. For surgery, 46% uh, percent of men required at least one pad two years after surgery, whereas for the patients who received SPRT, this was 4.5% of men, and this was highly statistically significantly different. And that just shows it over time. So um, surgery got a little bit better over time. SPRT stayed pretty constant and remained very low. Important to note that most of the men, even after surgery, were just requiring one pad a day. Um, but I still think that's really important and for men to know that after surgery, they may just want to wear a pad, even if it's just for security. Um, but I think it's very important for decision making before men embark on radical treatment. So we had the co primary endpoint of bulb mother, and this is something called an EPIC score. So the top score you can get is 100. And to, give, to put it in perspective, people who are suffering from significant bowel bother would have scores around 50. Um, so they were, they were a bit better um, for surgery than radiotherapy, but in fact, bowel bother was very minimal in both. It was significant, uh, it was worse for SBRT, but, that, but the symptoms were very minor. And if we look at that in a little bit more detail, patients who describe no problem on the top line. So you can see that most of the people who had SBRT um, that was worse in surgery, described a small bother. Only one had a moderate problem and no one had a big problem. The other important um, decision for which men face when they're um, thinking about radical treatment is, is sexual function. Um, again, the top you can score is 100. Um, and so for surgery, two years after treatment, 
the um, EPIC sexual bother score was 29.3 and for SBOT 57.7. And if we look at that graphically, the top line is SBRT. You can see that for both cohorts, they were pretty similar at the start. There's obviously a significant number of men that are already reporting some bother with uh, some loss of sexual function before starting treatment. The SBRT line at the top drops, and then it comes close back to baseline, but not quite. The surgery drops more precipitously. It does improve somewhat, but doesn't get anywhere near back to baseline. So the conclusions are that compared with surgery, patients receiving SPRT reported better urinary continence and less sexual bother. Uh, the SPRT reported worse bowel bother um, symptoms at two years. Um, I haven't shown you the CTAC toxicity, but there was no difference. So that was clinician reported. Um, and the efficacy data will be, will be due in, at uh, the five-year mark, which is probably two to three years from now. So I think in this case, in my view, the scales are tipped. I think there's SPRT would be um, in many ways a preferable treatment. Obviously, there's still a role for radical prostatectomy, but I do strongly feel patients should be, this data should be shared with them. And just for a bit of humor, I know which one I would choose. Thank you.